by two-minute silence. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, 1918, is the time that the ceasefire treaty was signed, symbolising the end of hostilities for World War I. In a few minutes, the New Zealand, Australian and United Kingdom flags will be broken. Please note that the two round gun salute at 11 will be quite loud. So those in the vicinity of their gun, and everyone else, are advised to cover their ears. I will provide a warning shortly before the salute is fired. Orders of service are available from RSA staff around the grounds. Later in the ceremony, the official parties will lay wreaths on the cenotaph. Anyone else may lay wreaths or poppies at the end of the ceremony.
The firing of the gun will occur in one minute, with the second round a minute after that, followed by a two minute silence. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to this Armistice Day service, the 102nd anniversary since the ceasing of war, World War I hostilities. I would like to formally welcome the members of the official party, our guest speaker, Colonel Retired Roger McElwain, President of the Otago Officers Club, Dunedin City Mayor, His Worship, Mr Aaron Hawkins. British Government Representative, Wing Commander Andy Bryant, and Australian Government Representative, Squadron Leader, Laurie Benia. I would like to introduce today's officiating chaplain, Aaron Knotts, 24 RNZIR chaplain. Kia ora, good morning. I warmly welcome everybody here this morning to this act of remembrance. In unity with many nations throughout the world today, 
we remember before God those who served their country in time of conflict. We pray for those who suffered as a result of war and for those who serve today on behalf at home and abroad. We will now join the RSA choir in singing God Save the Queen. We will now offer a prayer of thanksgiving for those who would like to join with me when I say thanks be to God, please recite that along with me. Let us pray. We offer to almighty God our thanksgiving for the many blessings with which he has enriched our lives. We give thanks for Her Majesty the Queen, our Governor General, the Prime Minister, our Mayor, and all who serve under them to bear the responsibility of government. Thanks be to God. For those who serve in the armed forces of our nation and of our friends and allies on sea and land and in the air, thanks be to God. For doctors, nurses, chaplains, and all who care for those in need or distress, thanks be to God. For the unity and goodwill of people, for the sacrifices made in two world wars and in later conflicts, to restore justice and to secure peace. Thanks be to God. For the Royal New Zealand Return Service Association and all ex-service associations, thanks be to God. We will now have readings from King's High School head boy, George Bates, and Otago Girls High School pupil, May Kavanagh. In hindsight. Far away, time to play. Fit and strong, won't be long. Sounds like fun, fire a gun. Dig a ditch, what's the hitch? A bayonet, but no fun yet. We're under fire, who's the liar? Won't be long, all gone wrong. Had enough, war is tough. Fit and strong, dead and gone. William Charles Harris was one of 90 men from the district of Monbolk in the Dandenong Ranges of Victoria who served in the Great War. He enlisted in 1916, aged only 18. He served with the 22nd Battalion of the Australian Imperial Forces. Following training in Egypt in 1916, he was posted to France in March of that year. In August, he was wounded and returned to the front line in September. He remained with the battalion until May 1917, when he was again wounded at Bulacor. He returned to his unit in June and was wounded again, however, remained with his unit. In November 1917, he was seriously wounded and returned to England for his injuries. After convalescence in England, he appealed against repatriation to Australia and rejoined his battalion in France in April. He was severely wounded at Villa, Villa Bratineau and died of wounds on the 22nd of July, 1918, at the 5th Casualty Clearing Station in France. 
Harris was buried at the Croy British Cemetery in the Somme. For his actions at Ypres, he was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for conspicuous gallantry and devotion to duty in continuing to lead his section in an attack, though wounded three times. He rushed a hostile blockhouse, silenced the guns, and captured the op op occupants. He remained at his post in the captured position, though wounded. Let us remember before God and commend to his sure keeping those who served, those who were injured, and those who died for their country in times of conflict, those whom we knew and those whose memory we treasure, and all who have lived and died in the service of humankind. I would now like to introduce our guest speaker, Colonel Retired Roger McElwain. Colonel McElwain had a 25 career in the Army with stints as a military observer in Bougainville, three years based in Bangkok as the New Zealand Defence Force attaché to Thailand, Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam, an eight month tour in 2007 as the contingent commander of New Zealand forces in Afghanistan and two years in command of the Waiuru Army Camp. He then returned to the Territorial Force and to where it all began as Commanding Officer of 2-4 Battalion. In civilian life, Colonel McElwain is the current President of the Otago Officers Club and CEO of the University of Otago Language Centre and Foundation Year. Sir, we are privileged to have you here with us today. Tato, good morning. On Armistice Day here in Dunedin in 1918, large crowds gathered and celebrated far into the night. Others did not feel like rejoicing. One woman had been nursing the wounded in France. Her fiancé, her two closest male friends, and her beloved only brother had all been killed. Now she walked away from the crowds alone. Later she wrote, although this was a different world, a world in which people would be light-hearted and forgetful, in which themselves and their careers and their amusements would blot out political ideals and greater national issues. This wasn't quite true. New ideals formed as people made different sorts of sense out of the death and the chaos left by the war. Over 100,000 New Zealanders had served in World War I, 18,500 had been killed and over 41,000 were wounded, some fully or partly disabled. A huge cost to a country of around one million people at that time. There was a degree of moving on, but not, at the same time not forgetting those who had been killed or injured. Survivors and bereaved tried to give traditional, often Christian meaning to the war deaths. But anyone who visits the military cemeteries in Flanders or the Somme battlefield can see how the cult of the fallen slowly changed over time. The first monuments talk about the supreme sacrifice, or repeat that they died that we might live. The later ones tend to leave God and sacrifice out of it. They only ask us not to forget or assert hopefully that their memory liveth forevermore. Rather than insisting on noble purpose, they express sadness and loss. The idea of a cenotaph, as we see here today, started as a practical idea for bereaved families. But the empty cenotaph soon became simply an official site for the annual commemoration of all the war dead, whether known unto God or named. But the core symbols of this ceremony are spare as if no gesture can really live up to the memory. A red poppy, a poignant silence is, I think, extremely fitting. Today, at times, I think that we have lost sight of the sheer horror and tragedy of war, 
not just at an international level, but also at the national and ind individual level. Leaders today are making increasingly bellicose statements around power, territory and resources. The Nine Dash Line in the South China Sea springs immediately to mind. Nations, even now, still go to war. Only last month, a war erupted between Azerbaijan and Armenia. State violence is increasingly seen as a means to achieve global and national aspirations. Ceremonies such as this one here today should serve to remind us of the horror and tragedy of war and that the human cost of conflict is to be avoided at all costs. It is appropriate to say here, least we forget. Thank you. I now call for the official party to lay wreaths. Major retired Bob Barlin, Vice President of the Dedenian RSA, will now give the Remembrance Dedication. This will be followed by the Ode for the Fallen in Te Reo by John Broughton, Associate Pro Professor, University of Otago, and then in English by Bob Barlin. When you go back home, say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. E kore rātou, e kaumātua tia. Pēnei i a tātou, kua mahune. E kore hoki rātou, e ngoi kore. Aha kō pia i ngā āhotanga o te wā. E te heki ngātu o te rā, tai noa ki ngā aranga mai i te ata. Ka mau maharo tonu tātou ki a rātou. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the last post where the national flags of New Zealand, Australia and the United Kingdom will be lowered. A 30 second silent tribute will then take place, followed by Ravelli.
Once again, as we offer prayers of intercession, I invite those who wish to join with me to say, hear our prayer. And now let us pray for peace of the world, for statesmen and women that they may have wisdom to know and courage to do that which is right, for all who work to improve international relationships that they may find the true way to reconcile people of different race, color, and creed for men and women the world over, that they may have justice and freedom and live in security and in peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all who suffer as a result of war, for the injured and the disabled, for the mentally distressed, for those whose faith in God and humanity has been weakened or destroyed, for the homeless and for refugees, for those who are hungry, and for all who have lost their livelihood and security, for those who mourn the dead, those who have lost husband or wife, children or parents, and especially for those who feel they have little hope to sustain them in their grief. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We now join together for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we live in perilous times with many in the world suffering due to the extent of COVID-19. There are those who are living with the hostilities of violence and war, others who despair following natural disasters. We know you wish for us to live in peace. We humbly ask for peace, for courage, for strength to overcome. Today we remember and we acknowledge your peace and those who have gone on before us to ensure we could live in freedom and for this, we give you thanks. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he show his favor upon you and give you peace. May we all do our part to live in harmony. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please join the RSA Choir in singing the New Zealand National Anthem.
ladies and gentlemen, that completes today's service. But before you depart, on behalf of the Dunedin RSA, I would like to thank Colonel Roger McElwain for being our guest speaker, the Dunedin RSA Choir, and bugler Ralph Miller. Thanks also goes to the Otago's Gunners Association who conducted the gun salute, and the RSA would like to acknowledge the significant behind the scenes contribution made by the Dunedin City Council and staff. That now concludes the Armistice Service for 2020. You are now welcome to come forward and view wreaths that have been placed on the cenotaph and add any wreaths or posies of your own. I would like to finish by thanking you for your attendance this morning and we look forward to seeing you here next year. Thank you.